ago we started a series in the fundamentals of the Kabbalah, and now we're holding towards the end. What I did last week was give you an introduction on the alphabet, because believe it or not, the alphabet is not just a set of symbols or letters as you find in other languages. It contains many Ramazim, many Sodot, many mysteries, many secrets of the Kabbalah as well. Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue, the language that the Torah is written in, the language in which the world was created in, and the Torah was given, is a very unique language. According to our tradition, according to the Torah, all the languages in the world stem, come from Lashon HaKodesh. And perhaps at another time I will give a separate lecture on demonstrating this incredible feat on how you can prove any language in the world, whether it's Chinese, Mongolian, Tagalog, Swahili, or Afrikaans. They all come from Lashon HaKodesh. If you follow it, if you trace them, it's incredible. And that's a separate lecture. Last week, I demonstrated to you a little bit the uniqueness of Lashon HaKodesh and the letters, how they have great significance, not only in the numerical value, which is called Gimatia, but also in the Tzurat HaOt, in the shape of the letters. These are unique symbols. And when you put the symbols together, they form words. And when these words are formed, these words actually describe the essence of what is being described. I will give you an example with the Kelev, Kulolev. The letters that make up the word Kelev, or dog, or Kaf, Lam, and Ved, have something to do with the essence of that animal. Today we're going to go through every one of the letters. We're going to see how beautiful it all fits in. How all the words, all the words in the Shona Kodesh, that have the same Shodesh, that have the same root, resemble each other. And I describe the difference between the first letter, the second letter, and the third letter of the Shorish. The first letter of every word, or of the root word, is the mafteh, the key to understanding what the word is all about, what the function is, what activity is happening. The second or second and third letters are also important because many words begin with the same letter, but they're slightly different once we see the second or third letter. So these additional letters can be called the garim, the seed of the, of the word. And once we are able to understand how these key letters or how these seed letters work, we will be able to figure out on our own what the meaning of a certain word is, even if we don't know Lashon HaKodesh. So, for those of you who are not here, I want to remind you that in Lashon HaKodesh, as opposed to Hebrew, which imported many words from foreign languages, the Hebrew spoke the day, in Lashon HaKodesh, the iron, there's nothing arbitrary. Everything has a reason. And when I say everything has a reason, I also included the Mikum, the particular set, the particular order of the letter. I gave you the example with Oneg and Nega. Oneg and Nega have the same letters, right? Ein, Nun, Gimel, but they're in a completely different order. Ein is the first letter in Oneg, but it's the last letter in Nega. So it's important for us to know the order of the letters, because even though they are the same letters, by being in a different position in the word, they will be something completely different. Before we begin to see the letters, I want to give you just a little bit of an overview about something which many of you perhaps are not familiar with. That is the pronunciation of the various letters. Last week I spoke about the halukah, the division of the letters according to Sefer Yetzirah. That there is mother letters, Otiyot Imahot, Aleph Memushim, which represent three elements of Abir, Mayim, and Esh, and there is the Otiyot Kulot, which I did not clarify well, and I'm doing it now. Otiyot Kulot, the double letters are Beget Kafra, because there are two ways of pronouncing them. I mentioned Otiyot Man Tzapa. These Otiyot Man Tzapa, Men Nun Tzadik Beitha, are also unique because they have a different form, a different shape when they are at the end of the word. But when we talk about Otiyot Kulot, double letters, we talk about Beget Kafra, because they have two ways of being pronounced. Then we had the Otiyot Shutot, which are the remaining letters of the alphabet. This is the way the Sefer Yitzhiyah divides the letters, with each one has a significance, each one symbolizes something, and each one is some sort of channel. But today, I want to do something a little bit different. The Zohar, as well as many Hebrew grammar books, divide the Hebrew letters into various categories depending on where and how they are pronounced. For example, you have the Otiyot Aleph, He, Ched, and Ayn, which are called Otiyot Groniyot, because they are pronounced from the throat. Aleph, 
head, eye, tail. The voice comes from the throat. Then you have the Yod Buma, Bey, Bad, Men, Tei, which are pronounced with the lips. Then you have a Yod Gichak, Gimel, Yod, which are pronounced with the head. I think that's called the palate in English, the sides. And then you have a Yod Dat Lemet, Dalet, Tet, Lamet, Nun, Tat, which are pronounced with the tongue. In order to pronounce these letters, you have to use your tongue. Then you have the letters Zayn, Sama, Tzadi, Reish, Shin, which one uses the teeth to pronounce these letters. The Zohar brings this down. You know, the Zohar was written many, many years ago. And if you want to have an idea of what the original pronunciation of the Lashon Kodesh is, you need to rely on this source, because this tells you where these letters are being pronounced, what part of the mouth. As with any language, Lashon Kodesh has also suffered a certain uh, weakening of the original pronunciation because of the many Galuyot. You had Jews that went to Iran, you had Jews that went to Iraq, you had Jews that went to North America. And unfortunately, even though the Jews may not have assimilated the ways of the Goim, it was very difficult to preserve the original pronunciation of Lashon Kodesh because it was very easily influenced by the language spoken in that location. So the many and the variety of pronunciations today in the world has to do with the fact that we're all dispersed in the Galut. And the language that was spoken in that area, in that region, greatly affected the, the original pronunciation. So I'm going to briefly go over with you what is approximately the real pronunciation of these letters, of these vowels, as they were pronounced during the time of the Bet HaMikdash. Some of you may be curious, how do I know? Well, there are several ways to know. Number one, we have to look at the oldest community that did not move around a lot. The Yemenite community is the one that least moved around. They have been in Teman, portions of Teman, even before the destruction of the first temple. A whole group of them left Eretz Israel when they heard the Nebuah of Yemiyah and Nabi of what was coming, and they left. So many of them were there until they came back to Eretz Israel from before the destruction of the first temple, and they did not move around. So if there's no value, there's no moving around, there's less of an influence on the language, on the customs, and so forth. That is one way of how one can tell, but even they were somewhat affected. After all, much, much, many years have, have passed, and as a result of that, there can, there can be some changes even in their pronunciation. Then you have another way of trying to figure out what the original pronunciation is, is by what I just mentioned, what the Zohar says. Where are these letters pronounced? What part of the mouth? And then number three, look at languages that are the most similar to the Shona Kodesh and see how they pronounce similar letters. The languages that are most similar to the Shona Kodesh are Aramaic in Arabic. And you're going to ask me, well, who speaks Aramaic today? Well, you still have Kurdish Jews in Kurdistan who speak Aramaic. And you can see how they pronounce the letters. And from Arabic, even though Arabic is a little bit different today, you still can get an idea and you can narrow it down as to what the original pronunciation is. The easiest letter to pronounce is Aleph. Aleph did not change because the Aleph sound exists in most languages in the world. And the same is true with Bet. But Bet with Aradat is a bit, and that's not pronounced by everyone the same. Because many of those who grew up in the Arab countries there is no V in Arabic. There is a V in Farsi, but not in Arabic. So therefore, they will not pronounce, they will not always pronounce the Bet correctly. But we know that Beget Kafrat have two ways of being pronounced. They cannot be the same. If there's a dot that's pronounced one way, if there's no dot that's pronounced another way. It cannot be the same. Then you have Gimel. Gimel is very easy for most people. Gimel is pronounced like a hard G. There is uh, one group of Yemenite Jews that pronounce the Gimel as a J. But besides that particular group, everybody in the world pronounces Gimel the same. That is the Gimel with the Dat. The Gimel with Aradat has been forgotten because it doesn't exist in most languages, except for Arabic and a few other languages in Farsi too, because they, they borrow many of the words from Arabic. And the Gimel with Aradat is a Then you have Dalet, the regular Dalet is D. 
But the Dalit and other Dalit have been forgotten because that pronunciation does not exist in most European languages except for Arabic, not even in Farsi. The Dalit and other Dalit is a Zah. Well, if you're an American speaker, that's easy because you recognize it immediately as the exact pronunciation of the word of the, this, therefore. That is the way Dalit is pronounced without a doubt. If we were to pronounce it correctly, we would be able to fulfill what the Allah says. When you say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elohim Hashem Echad, we would be able to say the Dalit long. If you do not say the Dalit correctly, it's impossible for you to say it long. You say Had, and you stop. You can't say a D for too long. But if you say it correctly as a Da, you are able to lengthen it properly. Hey, for most people, is not a problem. Hey, hey is like an H. Vav has become a big problem because Vav originally was a W. Wow. Well, but because in most European languages there is no W, many European Jews, when they come to this country, what do they say? What do you want? They have a hard time pronouncing the W. It doesn't exist in Europe. But it did exist in Arabic. So Arabic-speaking Jews had less of a problem with the Vav. The same is true with the Yemenite. In Farsi, that's a little bit different. Then you have the, the Zayn. The Zayn has been the same for the most part. Every word is like a Z, that is good for most languages. Then you have the Het. Het has been somewhat forgotten because it doesn't exist in the European languages. Het is very special, very unique. So if it doesn't exist there, it would have been more difficult to retain it, and that is why it was forgotten by most Ashkenazi Jews. The Sephardi country, no problem. It, had, it exists in Arabic. It does not exist in Farsi. So they have more of a difficulty in Farsi pronouncing the head, because everything is a Then you have head. Head is not the same as top. There are no two letters alike in Hebrew. But because the differences are so slight, most people forgot what the Fed is supposed to be. Fed is pronounced Fed, like in the Arabic word Fale, or Fawil. It's not Ta. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a bit different thing. So that one was forgotten. Yud is the same everywhere. Kaf is pretty much the same everywhere, with the dot. Kaf without a dot is Kaf. Even though in many languages in Europe there is no Kaf, because in many Jews spoke Yiddish, they had no problem remembering the Chah, because in Yiddish, which is a Germanic language, the Chah exists. Had there been no Yiddish, maybe even the Chah would have been forgotten. Then you have the Lama, the El, which exists, except for Japanese, maybe they had a hard time pronouncing the L, or the R. Uh, then you have the Men, which is the same, and Nun, which is the same, Sama, which is the same, and the S. Ayn, which is difficult. Ayn does not exist in many languages in the world, not in Farsi either. Uh, only in Arabic. That is why many have forgotten or are not used to it. Pay is the same. Pay that is pay with a dot. Pay without a dot is an F. Now, if you're an Arabic speaker, true Arabic speaker, you're going to have a problem with pay. Most Arab speakers cannot say pay. That is why they say bobo. Instead of saying bolepo, they say bobo. They can't say pay. I'm sorry, they can't say pay. Farsi is no problem because there is a letter for K. Then you have the Sadi. Sadi has also been forgotten because Sadi is not a, a, it's pronounced today as a TS. It's Thaw, like in Arabic. It doesn't exist in Farsi either, even though they have the same letter as they do, as they do in Arabic, but the pronunciation is different. Then you have Kuf. Kuf has been forgotten because Kuf is not like Kaf. It doesn't exist in most European languages. It's pronounced Kof, it's a little harder, and because it's very different, it has been forgotten. Amongst the Yemenite Jews, there is a difference between the Kuf. Some say it's a Kuf, and some say it's a Guf, Guf, like a regular G. Then you have Reish. Reish has many varieties, depending if you're a German Jew, or if you're an Italian Jew, or if you're an American Jew. And many people have forgotten that it's not raw. That's English. English, as they say, raw. The R in, in Hebrew is rolled like it is in the Latin language and except in French. French don't roll the R either. But in Arabic, in the in Farsi, and in the Latin language and except for French, the R is pronounced as Rashana Kodesh Reish was. Reish. And then you have Shin. Shin is SH, which is very similar everywhere. But even Shin, believe it or not, there were communities in the world that have a problem saying Shin is said. S for shame. They would 
say symbolic, instead of symbolic. That occurred occasionally, <coughs> but most of the community did not forget what a shim is. And then you have tap, which comes with the dot and without a dot, a dot on the top is pronounced tap, D, and without a dot is pronounced like the th in the English word thin. It's not like a samak, like the Ashkenazi doors, because samak is samak. And the sin is sin. The tap without a dot is like a th. The only ones who pronounce it today like that are the Yemenite Jews and the Iraqi Jews. The Iraqi Jews of Babylonia retained a lot of the rules of grammar of Hashanah Kodesh, and that is why many of the older people, at least today, are able to pronounce that correctly as well as the Kuf. When it comes to the vowels, there has been also some confusion. Fatah is the easiest one, because Fatah is used in all the languages. It's an A, it's a, it's a large, big A, like the A in father. If you speak Farsi, in Farsi there's two types of A, there's A and there's A. So you have, you have to remember that we're talking about the big A, and not the smaller A. Uh, when it comes to Segol, Segol is not A, like it's pronounced today by most uh, Jews. A is Tzere, Tzere is pronounced A. For example, Israel, there's a Tzere underneath the other. So what is Segol? If you ever have a chance to read Rashi, she speaks from time to time about the big book, about the Hebrew grammar, and he calls the Segolu Fatah Katan. It's a small Fatah. The best example is in the English language and in Arabic, you have a small and a big A. For example, in English, a big A is father, a small A is fat. Eh, fat. It's not fat, right? It's fat. See the difference? One is big and one is small. Hedik. Hedik is the E sound. Everybody pretty much pronounces the E the same. Except that there is an E with the Yud and an E without a Yud. An E with the Yud is an open E, and E without a Yud is closer. One is E and one is E. And then you have Kubut and Shuru. You have a long or big U and a smaller U, U and U. Because it's so close, most communities do not make a difference between them. Even at most the Temani, I always catch them. And I ask them, why don't you distinguish what they of course, they, they have forgotten about that too, but there are differences. The Sheva is a more of a neutral sound, uh, and according to the Yemenite community, it all depends on the word. The Sheva can be pronounced sometimes differently, depending on which letter comes before it or after it. Then you have Kamatz and Hola. Kamatz, what does Kamatz mean? The word Kamatz means Likmotz and Asfatani, to close the lips. So Kamatz is pronounced in most communities except for the Sephardim. Oh, the Sephardim have a difference between the small Kamatz and the big Kamatz. For example, in the word Chokhmah, the first one is small, and pronounced Oh, and the last one is Ah. So this has slightly varied over the generations because of the of the Galut. And then you have the Holam. Holam used to be called in old Hebrew grammar Malakom. Malakom means the full mouth. So you pronounce as though you have a full mouth. Uh, like the French sound is. Uh. The only ones who pronounce it that way today are some Yemenites. Not all the Yemenites pronounce it that way. So that one is a difficult sound, and that's the whole thing forgotten. Did I cover all the vowels? This is basically just I wanted to give you an overview of what had happened. Not only is Lashana Kodesh not in use today, today we use modern Hebrew, which has many words from other languages. But even the correct pronunciation today is not uh, known. Until Mashiach comes, when the Navi says that Kalosh Baruch will choose for us one pronunciation, one language, the Fahad Nuran, and everybody will use the same Musa, the same Sidur, everything will be one. We will not have many communities, many versions, and many differences. Okay, before we start the presentation, I just want to remind you that hopefully this will work. There are many letters, I shouldn't say many, there are several letters that are the same or similar, as I said last week. Based on the numerical value of the letters, you will find that Bet, Kaf, and Reish have similarities. Bet is 2, the numerical value of Bet is 2, the numerical value of Kaf is 20, which is also 2, and the numerical value of Reish is 200, which is also 2. So hopefully, if this is working, we will be able to see 
that there are many words that contain these letters, that even though they appear to be different letters, but because they're what's called gematria kana is the same, because the numerical value is the same, they have similar meanings. So uh, let's see if this is working again. All right, so let's begin with the letter Aleph. That's the name of the letter, numerical value one. What the letter means, Aleph, is to teach, or it means the superior being, as we spoke about it last week, Akadosh Baruch Hu, number one. The key to the letter is the essence, or the root, or the primiyut, of, the, of, a, of a word. Whenever you see an Aleph at the beginning of a word, that is what it symbolizes. Here is a, an example of many words with Aleph that have something in common. As I mentioned last week, Aluf, Adon, Av, Em, Father, Mother, as an example. They are they give birth. They are the first in line. And the, the shape of the letter is made up of a Yud, a Vav, and a Yud, which is numerical value equal to 26, which is another remez, another hint to the Shem Hashem. Aleph being number one, therefore is representative of all of this. Okay, now let's see Bet. That's the way it's called, Bet, equals number two. It means a house. And whenever you see the letter Bet, it involves building, creating something which is material, or something which is zugi, couples, because it's two. Here are some examples of some words. Ben, Bat, Bechor, Bina, Binyan, Bria, Bracha, all beginning with the Bet. There's something being shaped, something being formed, whether it's a house, whether it's a son, or whether it's a daughter. Or even the word Beratha is a creation of sorts. And you have the shape of the letter where you can see a roof on top and at the bottom. An example of where the letter Bet appears in position number one, where all these would have similar uh, functions. Even though they would be totally different words, the first letter being the function, the key to the word, what is happening, what is being done here. <coughs> then you have Gimel. That's the way it's called, number three. It means Mul. Mul means to do, to act, especially if we're talking about kindness. Whenever you see the word, the letter Gimel at the beginning of a word, it has to do with movement, going up, lifting. And by the way, that is why the word Gag is called Gag, the root. You have two gimels because it's very high. Here's some words that have a gimel that you will see the similarities between them. Gag, Gadol, Gvul, Geshev, Gibor, Geder, Gezel. There's some movement happening, something going in the upper direction. Even something like Gezel. The money is going from Mr. A to Mr. B. See, there is movement to something. Move into different things depending on what the other letters in the word is. Gibor, somebody who is strong. That means it's Meruman, it's higher. Geshev, Gibor, it connects between two points. Gadol, and the shape of the letter Gimel has the shape of a Adam Olech. It has a Vav or a Zayn together with the Yud. It symbolizes a man walking, a man doing Maatsin, doing good deeds. So there's action happening in this letter. Action in that increases, whether it's the increase of value, whether the increase of height, as we will see with other letters, there's different forms of growth and increase. Letter Dalet. Dalet is called Dalet, it's number four. It comes from the word Dalut, poor. The essence of this letter is its limit, just like a door. Door limits, when you close it, you open it, then it comes in. A poor man is also limited. Some words that have Dalat as the first letter, Dal, Delet, Derek, a way. What is a way? It's also limiting. You go only on this way, you don't go off the way. Devik, blue, duck, thin. Even the word Doeg, to worry, he's limiting himself. And Din, judgment, is also limiting, constricting. Yeah, there are many words. I just gave you a few examples here. And the shape of the letter Dalat is a Surash and Delet, the shape of a door. So, as I said last week, there's a reason why the shape is, is, is such. There is a significance to the numerical value. And as you can see, all these words have something in common. At least the third, very first letter is unique to all of them. Hey, number five. Hey opens up. 
is that in the action, whenever you see the word hey, the letter hey, you don't have too many words that begin with the hey in the root word. It has to do with opening up. Delet and Joseph closes, or the following letter opens up. Whenever you see the hey in the very beginning position, and even if you see it in other positions, it has something to do with opening up or revealing. Here's some example. Head, an echo. Hede, to pronounce. Halel, to praise. Abed, to see. Hakeh, to recognize. Hadar, hod, glory. All of these have something to do with the openness or the revelation of whatever it is that we're talking about. Revealing, opening, and even when you're praising, you are praising openly. You are talking about it. You are promulgating it. And the shape of the hay ha- contains a dot with the you together. Which if you were to look deeper into it, there is a significance of why the hay is combined from these two letters. Then you have the vav. Vav is number six. It means a hook or a connection. Vav connects. That's what it does. It shows continuity. It shows life. There's a certain regularity to it. Vetek, vetek, vad. People coming together, they're connecting. Vikuach, an argument. What's an argument? An argument between two people who are connecting. Vidui, confessing, which is also connecting with your thoughts. Veshet, anybody know what a veshet is? The food pipe, also connecting down to the stomach. Valad, before a child is born, it's called a valad. Why? Because it's connected to his mother. So the first letter, Vav, is connection. Everything that has to do with connection. And the shape is of a straight line, because according to the Kabbalah, it also means Yosher, straightening. Then you have Zion, number seven. It means to feed, to nourish. The essence of this letter, or wherever you see this letter, has to do with the will to give in a much more powerful way, including Zivug, husband and wife, being intimately involved, it, ha- it also is mashpia, it also gives, noten. that is what Zion represents. So whenever you see the Zion in the following words, that's, that's the action that is happening. Zeren, a flow, right, it's going down, the mashpia, the waters are coming down. Rub, zakhar, zakhar, the male, mashpia, he gives. Zera, the hand, the hand delivers, the hand gives. It's nut which is a bad form, a negative form of giving, giving in the wrong place. Zera, a seed, which is also the action of giving, of being mashpia, of zivug, of connect, giving out a powerful voice. What you see here is the first letter having the same function, the same action, but once you combine it with additional letters, you obviously have different words and different ideas. And the zayn is in the shape of a crown sitting on top of a vav, or as some would say, it also looks like a clay zayn, like weapon, because it's a forceful action. Then you have chet, number eight, it has to do with hayut, or life, the essence of this letter, wherever you see it, means the, the, the desire to receive, to connect, to want to, to have. So in the following word, haver, the very first letter of the word friend, haver means you want to have a friend. You want to have something for yourself. Chepet, hafet, the desire. You see the letter chet, the same thing. Hafam, who's a hafam? Halomet mikol adam. He wants to learn. He wants more chokmah for himself. Chayim is life, which we all want to have. Cheder, a room. Herut, freedom. A harev or kurban, destruction. All of these, even though they're somewhat different, they have something to do with the either with the word. The haber, to connect, to want, to desire, and the shape of the letter, shne davim or vavim zayin, depending if you, if you write according to the ari, or you write it the regular way, the head can have either two vav, or a vav and a zayin connected with a hatoteret, with like a, a little hook on top. Here you're not seeing the real shape of the way it appears in the Sefer Torah. In the Sefer Torah you will see the real kitab ashuri, which looks a little bit different than this. But that's the idea behind this letter. There's a combination of two letters forming a new letter. Then you have Tet, number nine. The word Tet comes from the word Tet, according to the Kabbalah, mud, afal, everything comes from the ground. And therefore, whenever you see this first, this letter in the first position, it's associated with Heret, with Mikah, with death, with destruction, always covering up, 
always ending, always going down. And you will see examples from all these words. Kabal, to dip, is going down. Karak means to destroy, to tear apart. Kameh is also destructive. Tahor is just the opposite of Kameh. How could that be? Right? So I explained last week that you can have negative and positive in the same letter. How is that? Because they both mean the same in the first position. The first position means the Tiyum. Or the Heret. Well, Tahor destroys the Tumah. Tumah destroys what Tahor. They're both doing a similar function, but it depends to who they're doing it. Remember this note? This note is Zayin, but it's a bad, it's a bad Hashba. Tavach, to slaughter, is also a form of killing. Tahan, to grind. The Fed is grinding, it's tearing apart. So what about Tov? What does Tov have to do with anything? Good. The letter Tet has to do with, as I wrote over here, Tiyum. Mita is death, but so is Tiyum. Tiyum means the end of something. Tov the Atakhlit. It's the end. It's complete. The Shalem. It's a different way of looking at, at this idea, but it's the same thing. We're talking about the end of something, whether it's the death of something, whether it's the thinking of something, or whether it's the end, the ultimate end, the ultimate purpose of everything, which in this case Tov represents. Shape of the set is the cast with a vav or a Talmud writer with his eye. Then you have Yud. Yud is it's called Yud, number 10. It has to do with the Yisod. It's the foundation of everything. It's the only letter in the entire alphabet that hangs in the air. It has no foundation of its own. It's the beginning of everything. It shows initiative. It shows growth. It shows completeness. Completion. Yisodi, fundamental. And here are some examples. Yad. Yad is a growth. It comes out. So is Yere, the leg. Yibum, Yabam. What does that have to do with anything? Well, that's also a form of Shlemut, of completion. Because if, if, if Reuven passes away and his wife is still alive and they have no children, there's a mitzvah for the, a, another living brother to be Meyabem, to complete this relationship and to hopefully eventually have a child. So the Yibum, the letter U, that has to do with initiative, with growth, and with completion. Yeled. Also, he, he was originally a Valad, now he's a Yeled. He's born. He's, it's a growth. Yafe. Beautiful. Yafe is Shlemut. It's complete. The first letter is Yud. It's complete. Yete. Initiative. Oli Tzor. To create. Yeda. Knowledge. Which also means to complete, to learn, to grow. They all have a similar function, even though they're slightly different words. They resemble each other in the first letter, in the first uh, idea behind this letter. And Yud is shaped this way because that is a little dot called in Kabbalah Nekudah Rishonah, because that's where everything comes from. That is with Hashem Hashem, Yud He, Vav He, also begins with the Yud. That's the beginning of everything. Then you have Kaf. Kaf is number 20. Kaf is represented in this way because, and it's called this way, I should say, because it's the kapayag, it's the hand, the palm of the hand. Whenever you see the kaf, it has to do with creating, giving form and shape, or forcing, closing, covering up. What you will notice with all these letters that they come in pairs, 22 letters, they are mamash pairs. One opens, one closes. One flourishes, one limits. Kaf is has a limiting effect to it. Closing, forcing, making a shape. When you make a shape, you are making a form, you are enclosing something. You are limiting that particular area. And here are some examples. A keli, a vessel. You have limited a particular spot. Kise, kaftor, a button. You have made a form or a shape. Keren, a vineyard. You have surrounded it. The vineyard has a cup to it because it's enclosed. Ktav. Handwriting, letters, you are making forms and shapes. Katef, a shoulder. Koach, power. All of this has something to do with limiting, covering, or shaping. And the shape of the letter Kaf is like a clicky bull, like a receptacle, ready to receive. A shoulder, for example. You put things on your shoulder. It receives, it's like a keli. Then you have Laman, number 30. Lam is from the word limud, to teach. Because the essence of this letter, wherever you see it in the first position, is to give birth, to grow, 
And when a person learns, he's growing. And it also has to do with gathering and combining. Because when you gather and you combine, you, it's a different type of growth. You can grow high, you can grow in abundance, you can grow in numbers. You will see different kinds of growth. The action occurring with the Lamed, especially in the first position, has to do with giving birth or becoming bigger and increasing in number or value. Here are some examples. Levush. You are bringing something onto yourself that wasn't there before. You're adding something. You're becoming bigger and fatter, maybe. Leda, giving birth. Lashon is a language. Because many words are composed and put together. Lev, the heart, which also has an important function in the body. It's supplying the blood. Leket, to gather. Laked, also to gather, to bring together. And Leom, anybody know what Leom is? A nation. What does a nation have to do with the Lamed? Because what is a nation? A gathering of people. So that is why Lamed is in the first position. Bringing together, increasing in number. And the shape of the letter Lamed is like a top with a bob on top of it. Even though it's not a, a straight top, a rounded top, but in the, in the Sepetara you will see it's a little bit more rounded than it is here. Then you have Mem. Mem is number 40. Mem comes from the word Mayim. What is Mayim? Mi Yam. Water comes from the ocean. What is an ocean? A body of water. So we're dealing again with a function which is restrictive. Magbil Oter Monea. Mayim, wherever you have water, unless it's flowing, it's enclosed. So what the water, the water or in this or as you can see this content has the function of limiting, holding back, restricting. And here are some examples. Mo'ed. Mo'ed is a time that you made out to get together. The Mo'adim, they occur during certain times of the year. So we are restricting it to this particular time. It's not like Ramadan. Ramadan can happen any time during the year, right? But it has to be the Sha'adim. It has to be in the spring. So it has to be exactly the same time of the year. Mo'ed. Mo'ed meaning we are magbilimete. We are restricting it at a particular time. Mahane, a camp, is being restricted. Mele, he has the power to restrict and to control. Mum, what mum? A defect. What does the defect have to do with, with these ideas? Because the defect restricts Allah. He's no longer shalem. There's something holding him back, a physical defect. Makat, he received a, an injury. That's also a limitation. Makom is a limitation. When you say Makom, you're talking about a particular place. You're not talking about the whole Olam. Makom, this specific place. So the man is restricting it to this spot. Malik, full. Well, if you're full, I hope you can't. You probably can't eat anymore after you're full, right? You're full. You're restricted. You're limited. And the reason it looks like that is because the man is shaped from a top with a valve on its side. The reason I put on its side is because you will find, you will see that there are all the letters that have also a top with a valve. Like the Laman who just got, but the, the Laman has the bottom on top, the Mem has the bottom on the side. Nun. Nun is number 50. Nun in Aramaic means fish. Whenever you see the Nun, especially in the very first position, it has to do with falling, separating, humbling, and moving, which are all similar. When something moves, it has separated. When something is separated, it could be falling. You see, I gave you various examples because they're all similar. The similar idea, similar action happening whenever you see the noise. So here are some examples of some words. Neder. You are nivzal. You are pulling yourself away from something. You're saying, I'm not going to have this. Nega. Also, when a person has leprosy, right, he's also separated from people. Nevela. It's not something which did not come out kosher, was not slaughtered properly. It's no good. It's separated. Nafal, to fall. Neshama. Nesh what does Neshama have to do with being separate? Well, it's a separate entity. It's not part of the body. Same thing with the word Nefesh. Navi. Ugan Nizdal. He's also separate. To be a Navi, you have to be Mitnatek. And you have to be, there has to be Hafna'a. There has to be a humbleness. You have to be away and separate from all the Ta'avot in the world, from all the worldly desires. So a Navi is called Navi because Unizdal. And Nefesh. A miracle is also separate. It's not nature. It's above nature. The mushroom is done. It's something different. And that is why the letter noon appears at the beginning of the word next. And then, and the letter noon is shaped like a zine or a vav, depending on how you write it, within an, up, an upside
upside down vav. As you can see, the bottom and the top look very similar. It says dain or vav connected to an upside down vav. Sama, this letter is completely enclosed. Called Sama, number 60, from the word somet to give support. Here are the ideas behind the, the Sama. Mesaber somet mekif. It creates order, it gives support, and it surrounds. Just like the letter is surrounded, it's circled, it's enclosed. The words that have the Sama in the first position are seder, order. It's born. When a person tolerates, when he has patience, that means he's supporting something. He tolerates, he carries something. So this, the keep, the surround, so get. What about sus? Why is a sus called a sus? Anybody want to guess now? Hopefully now, by now you know how this works. Why is a sus called a sus? Based on these concepts over here. Which one fits a sus? The horse. We ride on a horse. We don't ride on turkeys. Right? We ride on a horse. A horse can carry us. A horse is called a horse of food because it can support us. It can carry us. It has a, therefore, it has a stomach in the beginning and at the end. It's a powerful. Sulam, a ladder, also has one of the ideas behind. One of the ideas behind the Sulam, the first idea, is the stomach to support us. And Satum, which means to seal, which is also a form of restriction, of closing in. Right? It's just like the shape of the letter Samak. The shape of the letter Samak is a cup with a bab and it's completely sealed. Then you have Ayn. Ayn number 70, it means an eye. Or some say it also means Ani, a poor, a poor man. Some of the ideas behind the letter Ayn, there may be more, but these are just some. It has to do with Aliyah, with going up, elevated, helping, and becoming stronger. For example, Ebed. Evan is a form of help. But then you have Ani and Ashir, again, two opposites. Ani, a poor man, Ashir, a rich man, both having an Ayn in the very beginning. How could that be? Well, again, different functions. The Ayn in Ani means that he is very poor. He needs his Haskud. He needs to become stronger. He would like to be up, but he's down. Ashir, on the contrary, he can help the Ani. He's in a better position than Ani. They both have the Ayn, but each one is doing something else. One is already up, one is still, would like to go up. One is still in the bottom. He needs help, the Ani. Eight, grow, stands up. And I didn't write it here, but the same is true with Eifid. The growth it comes out. It has an Ain coming out of the ground. Ez has to do with it has good because Azut, becoming stronger. Now, what did we say before? These are all similar ideas. So becoming stronger and growing and helping are very similar. Whether you make someone stronger, whether you help someone, whether you raise him, lift him, this is all similar. Avon. Avon is also having done something which went out, came out of you, which is a negative one. It's not a mitzvah, it's a bad thing that came out, a growth, a bad growth. You can have a cancer. Cancer is also growth. It's a bad kind of growth. You have anava, which is humbleness. What does humbleness have to do with any of these concepts? So I would think if we have somebody who's humble, he has full control over himself. And the shape of Ayn is like a Yud or a Nun, together with the Zayn connected at the bottom of the page. Then you have Pei. Pei is number 80. And the reason it's called Pei because it has, it's like a mouth. Whenever you see the letter Pei, it has to do with an opening. Always. You will always see it. The essence of this letter is opening or scattering, liberating, or solving. This also has to do with opening. When you solve a problem, you are opening it up. When you scatter something, you are completely opening it up. It was once together, and you let and letting it go, letting letting it go outside. Here are some words. Lefaleg means to break up, to divide. The first letter is say has to do with division, has to do with opening up something that works together and united. Panim, the face, the face is on the open. People can see it. It's exposed. Pesa, there's an opening in the skin. The pay is an opening. Pera, a flower, the blossom, the first letter is opening. Lifroa, Porea, Pera, is also to open up. Lifroa, Pesa, the opening, the door. And Porek, which also means to remove, to take out, to open up, to redeem. And the shape of the pay is very interesting. If you look inside, you will see a new letter being shaped 
in the open space of the face, that letter is the bit, even though here it's not so clear. The letter face itself is composed of a cap and a yud, but within it, if it's written correctly, in the empty space you will see a bed being formed. Then you have a sadi. Sadi is 90. Sadi represents tzedek justice. Sadi is limits again, constricting, limiting. What did they do? They opened up, revealed, exposed, comes along sadi, following the face, and limits, and constricts, and hides. Sadi. Sad is a side. You're talking about this side. So you're talking about something which is limited. Tzedek is justice, which is also limiting something to the right law. Som is a fast. You're limiting yourself. You're abstaining from food and water. Sara, when you're in pain, it's a limitation. You can't do what you'd like to do. You're limited. Sad is a commandment. You have to do what you're being told. Tameh, you're thirsty. You have a limitation. And tipui, a covering. When you cover something, you are limiting it, or hiding it, restricting it. And the shape of the letter Tzadi looks like a yud with a nun or a zan. Kuf. This one is interesting. The equivalent number of kuf is a hundred. It means to surround a kef. Whenever you see it in the first position, it has to do with kirvaz, bringing something closer or being at the end, or acquiring. They're all similar. When you bring something closer, you're at the end. Because when you reach the end, you've come close. Tinyan, acquired, you've also brought it close to you because you've acquired it. You see how these are all related? But we, I needed to put all three because the various words do not all show closeness, but they show acquisition. Acquisition is closeness. Here are some words. Ket. The first letter of the word ket, ket meaning the end, is a kuf. We're talking about getting close. The end. Le kabel to receive. Kever. A grave. Also the end. Kadosh. Holy. Becoming closer to Hashem. Katan. Small. Also has to do with being close. Close to the ground. Kriya. To read. When you read, you bring it close to your eyes. Kesher. When you tie something, you put the two together. You bring them close to each other. And the shape of the kuf is a kaf with a nun. Peshuta. A nun peshuta means the long nun, loy, not a nun kefufa, the longer nun. Combination of kaf and nun. Reish, as it's called, number 200. Before we get to it, I forgot to tell you the interesting part of kuf. According to the Kabbalah, what's kuf? There's an animal called the kof. According to the Kabbalah, kof has to do with imitation. The animal called the monkey is an imitation of man. That's what the Kabbalah says, because the Tum'ah, Kohota Tum'ah, have imitations of the Kohota Kedusha. So therefore, Kof, according to the Kabbalah, represents imitation as well. It's a deeper meaning, because as we said last week, there are two ways of looking at it, on the positive and on the negative side. Many of these functions can have a positive or a negative effect. Yes? He comes from the side of the Puma. He's not a kosher animal. That's correct. That's right. So it has nothing to do with taking away. It just it represents an imitation. Just like there is an imitation in the Puma of the Kohota Kedusha, there is an imitation in the monkey of a human being which has a element of things that the monkey does not have. Resh is 200. Resh means the head. The idea behind the Resh, whenever it's in first position, well, even if it's in, in a second or third position, but mostly when you see it in the beginning, you ha it's easier to to see the effect of it. It has to do with ribui, pru It has to do with multiplying ram to become greater, to become the head, to become stronger, to concentrate. When you concentrate, you're multiplying something of the same. Here are some words, rishon, rosh, being the first, being the head. Rasha. What does rasha have to do with a reish? Why does rasha have a reish? Because the Reish means to be Ram, to, to, to think highly of yourself. And according to the Kabbalah, the Reish is associated with Gava, with arrogance. And Rasha is arrogance. Ram is the same Gimatia, the same numerical value as Amalek, thinking highly of himself. Ra, evil. But wait a minute, I know another word that is a good word that has the same two letters as Ra. Anybody know? Rea. Yaasta, the Rea Kamofa. A friend, you should love your friend as yourself. Rea is a friend, a very close friend. It's not a haver which people are just connected 
Ali. Rea is a close friend where the Torah says the Haftal and the Haftal like yourself. Equal. Running back. But if you look at these concepts, you will see that they have something in common, just the vowels are different. Running is gabrut, something which is very, very no good. An increase of something which is no good. What is Rea? An increase of affection. An increase in the connection. More intimacy. You see what I mean? So the Reish means to multiply, to increase. It could be something good. It could be something no good. Depends what we're talking about. Rat, let's go back to Rahamim, also mercy, to have much feeling for someone. Rat, to run, you're increasing your pace, you're going quickly. Rotseach, you're overpowering someone. It's Gabrut on something, which is also increase of power. You're killing him. Rahil, anybody know what Rahil means? The gossip. What does what the gossip do? Talk a lot. See? So the reish in the word Rahil has to do with the increase in the amount of speech, which is a sur. Shape of the letter reish is like a cuff without the corner, without the curve. Then you have shin, which is, has a value of 300. Shin comes from the word shinayim, teeth, because what is happening here is something is changing. When you use your teeth, you are changing this food. You are taking it apart and it's being transformed into something else. So the essence of Shin, when you see it, has to do with Shinui, with change, with Ma'avara, with going from one place to another, changing position. Or Meshachre, liberating. Liberating means it was here, it was not free, and now it's free to go. Here are some words, Shalia. Shalia, messenger, goes from one place to another. So there's a Shinui, there's a change. Second, that's very typical, a line, that's a big change, change from the truth. Shabbat comes from the word shed, to sit. Well, you're standing, now you're sitting, that's a change of position. Shoha, we're trying to change the emet. By using shoha, by using a bride, the shin shows shinui, the shanot et emet. Shalom, simcha. What does shalom and simcha have to do with the shin? Because in order for there to be shalom, there must have been no shalom before. In order for there to be simcha, the person must have been sad before. These concepts show a change in the mood, a change in the status. Before it was no shalom, a shav ye shalom, the rashim. Something happened that there was a change. Something happened that now there is simcha, there was a joy. Shegada, also, you didn't intend it, it's a mistake, you did it accidentally. There is a change, change from your original intention. I didn't intend to do it this way, but it happened with the change. Now this is a very interesting shape. If you look at the Tefillin, you will see that sometimes the Shin has three heads and sometimes the Shin has four heads. Usually it has a three heads, and the heads are somewhat different. One head looks like a Bab, one looks like a Yud, and one looks like a Zion, all with a foundation. Connecting the bottom. It's not a real foundation. When you look at the Sefer Torah, you will see that it's a lot more pointy. It's not flat like it is over here. In the Tefillin Shal Rosh, you will see on the one side that this four, why this four? Because according to the Kabbalah, the three heads also represent Kohen Nezi Israel. And the fourth head, all the converts that are part of Amistad as well. And finally, the last letter, Tav. What does Tav mean? Tav is equals 400, and it's a Siman, it's a sign. That's Latin Tav, means to put a sign. And whenever you see the Tav, it represents completion. It's the last letter to complete, mimut, completeness, and it's also restrictive. It also unifies. As you can see in the following examples of these words, hamim, complete, naive, or sincere. Letaken means to fix. You're completing something when you're fixing it. Torah is <coughs> something also complete, something that you, you hand over but something which is complete. The Torah is a complete chokmah that Hashem gave us. It's unified. Toshad, an inhabitant, a citizen, is also limited to a particular spot. He lives here, he's a citizen of this place. Thelmin, twins, are also combined together. They're born together as one. And chum, or limit, or border, where something stops, where something ends. It's the same idea of Taf. The shape of Taf looks like a dollar together with an upside down box. Just uh, to finish up, there are many ideas 
according to the Kabbalah, that uh, I did not put over here on the, on the display. And I'll go over it quickly if we have a little bit of time. Perhaps I'll tell you first some interesting ideas. I told you last week that once we know the meaning behind the letters, we can figure out what words mean. 